Hi, I'm Sandy Brown, Mayor of the Town of Orangeville, and this is Talk 519 uh, on Rogers TV. We're discussing matters that are of interest to residents of the Town of Orangeville and Dufferin County. Tonight's show, we have uh, Councillor Grant Peters joining us. Grant, thank you for coming. My pleasure, Sandy. Um, one of the first things I wanted to talk about was the excitement that's going on right now with uh, our NBA team, local NBA team, the Toronto Raptors. and. Uh, you know, we um, last Sunday we, we had a great uh, outdoor event. We kind of made Jurassic Park Orangeville. And uh, I wanted to thank you for initiating uh, that whole sequence of events. Uh, you texted me Thursday morning, said, hey, think we can pull this together. And uh, from that quick, uh, oh, and here's, uh, here's the picture. There's Grant <laughs> down, uh, down low with your son, I believe, on yeah, the cool. lower left. And we had quite a crowd. I I think there was four or five hundred people there at the beginning of the game. Uh, it was uh, it was chilly um, a Sunday night, but uh, I think um, the experience was great for the town, the uh, community aspect of it. And uh, can you talk to just about your thoughts yeah, were about I'd love it? So. I mean, those type of events have always been what I've loved about Orangeville: getting people together on the street, having uh, you know a social gathering, that kind of thing. Uh, in this case, it's more of a, even a national issue, right? The entire country is behind the Raptors. And when I noticed that other municipalities were getting the rights to show the games, for me, that licensing issue always seemed to be the big hurdle. Right. And you know, with, with that out of the way and a quick talk with Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, they want to see as many people yeah. at games and watching yeah. games as possible. And so uh, once that was over with, and, and you know, certainly with your help in reaching out to the community, they really rallied behind us, and I think it was a fantastic evening. Were you as surprised as I was, the, the ease with which you got permission? Because, <laughs> you know, in my life, you know, dealing with professional sporting organizations, they're sure. very, very protective of their brand, of their, their, you know, their television rights and all these things, and uh, these people were very open. Agreed. Yeah, yeah and, and in speaking with the gentleman that I did at MLSC, I mean, they've had decades without making it to a premier final like this. You know, yeah. the Leafs haven't been there. The Raptors are now finally there. They're on cloud nine and, uh, you know, their generosity to the communities. Yeah. Uh, and it's returned in favor by having these events and, and getting people out to the games. Yeah, it's wonderful. I, I was kind of shocked, uh, actually, to see Jurassic Park Toronto in that first game and to look down I don't know what, I know it's near York Street there, I guess it's Bremner, Bremner Boulevard, yeah. leading up to uh, Scotiabank Arena, a canyon of people. I mean, it looked yes. like, uh, you know, a ticker tape parade in, in New York City <laughs> or something. It, exactly. It really was remarkable. There must have been 10,000 people there. Yeah, uh, exactly. And they're so, getting the same crowds in other municipalities. Yeah, and so, uh, it's really a wave. You know, and for those of you who, you know, aren't, you know, sp sporting enthusiasts, um, I, I think it's great for those members of the community that love their sporting and you know for me I'm not a hardcore basketball fan I, I watch it peripherally but when the playoffs start I'm right I'm there and uh, when the March Madness comes around I'm watching exactly. and uh, you know I do like basketball and and to see these guys like you know you really um, uh, you know Kawhi Leonard for instance uh, he's sort of a, a, a quiet um, you know, but a determined player, and he's just fantastic yes. on every level. And uh, what you know, there's nothing not to like about that guy. Right? Agreed. You know? And and again, even for the non-basketball fan, like you said, yeah. you don't have to be uh, a blues and jazz enthusiast to enjoy the festival, yeah. right? You don't have to be a farmer to enjoy the uh, the fall fair. So right. you know, these are community events, and yeah. it's as much about the people around you as it is what's on the screen. Yeah. Great. Well. Um, Grant, you're an environmental engineer, and uh, you know the environment and the concern for the environment is something that uh, you you live professionally and, and also personally, right? I mean, that's it's, right. It's your, you've got a, a real strong commitment uh, throughout your life on this, right? I have, yeah, yeah and and it's it's personal uh, and family values and everyday habits. Um, mm -hmm. As you said, it relates to to my business in the engineering world. And it was a main portion of my platform, um, you know, yeah. during the fall and, yeah. and getting people mm -hmm. to understand the impacts that municipalities can have right. uh, and should have on the environment, positive yeah. ones. Yeah, and I and you know, again, I don't know the first time you and I met, 
maybe a year ago, I don't know, sure. you know, in the midst of thinking about running and, you know, we, we yeah. bump in each other at different events and things. So, uh, but uh, I really enjoyed you uh, as, as a member of council and your, your friendship. And uh, I just, I think, um, you know, we need a sort of a point person on, on, on this portfolio, if you want to call it sure. that, right? That, and, and you don't, you know, this isn't just uh, spouting off. You you know the science behind it. You, uh, I think you know what sustainable living is all about and, and uh, how we can make our town better right on that front. Agreed. Right. Yeah, and, it, and it's, uh, I hate to be a one trick pony kind of thing, but sustainability really does cover a lot of branches, uh, yeah. not just of government, but of, of mm -hmm. daily life, like mm -hmm. you said. And uh, I appreciate the, the kind words and I found that this council has been very open to these concepts and discussing the potential to, to implement solutions, be it you know, a very small issue of lighting at the arena, for example, uh, right up to the adopting of the, the Sustainable Neighborhood Action Plan, which you know, we'll be seeing in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, anybody that, that's pushing back on these issues, I think really needs to take a second, uh, pause for a second, uh, sober, sober thought, you know, because um, it, it's pretty clear to me in my lifetime that climate is changing. Um, some people talk about, you know, cyclical changes in nature, which, right. which is, is part of it, but uh, the science is pretty clear on, on carbon uh, dioxide in the atmosphere been measured. It's been measured in glaciers, I believe. They can go yep. back uh, thousands of years, and they've, they've traced this, right? It's right. This is not, uh, um, you know, somebody's uh, th a theory. This is a proven fact now. Right? Exactly. So I think um, things like reduction in, in, uh, in carbon and uh, uh, emissions, uh, it, it's been happening. I mean, you know, some people not as quickly as, as they'd like. Right. But what, what's your thoughts about the carbon tax? Because it's kind of out there as a, you know, it's, it's the uh, topic du jour, I sure. think. And uh, how do you think it, it, it will work? I know that the Ford government is trying to quash it, but the federal government's very strongly behind it right now. And, yeah, and, and several provinces are adopting it. A lot of proponents of the carbon tax see it as uh, a comprehensive solution. Um, it's, it's trying to put an accounting system on something that doesn't necessarily have a direct economic um, tie-in to most people's minds, right? Most people are, you know, can relate to dollars and cents and pluses and minuses, but uh, it's a little less tangible when you, when you talk about atmosphere and uh, greenhouse gases and that kind of thing. So um, whether it's the correct comprehensive solution to it, uh, I think there's people on both sides, as you've said. Um, we definitely need a solution and, and working with something in the interim while we you know, figure out exactly yeah. what the best one is, uh, is certainly better than doing nothing. Yeah. Um, and what it really comes down to is those that are creating the largest issues, the, the largest polluters and the ones that are contributing the most to the contribution of, of uh, mm -hmm. climate change need to, uh, it needs to be reconciled yeah. in some fashion. And um, you, know, you need uh, a system that is gonna weight those contributions uh, or lack of contributions in a meaningful way. Right, right. Um, I'm just um, I'm just wondering about how you balance the um, natural resources of this country and the abundant natural resources from fossil fuels, particularly. And al although you know tar sands is 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 an ugly word in some people's minds, it's uh, it's a resource that um, scientists have you know, found a way to harvest it. And I, you know, they're, they're trying, I actually, when I was at the conference in uh, Quebec City last weekend, I actually talked to some oil sands proponents. They were right. there particularly to talk to people like me and convince us that, it, and uh, you know, they're the scar on the land and all that, but you know, what they're claiming is yes, it's gonna be a systematic process, but we're gonna return the land to you know, after we extract the oil from the sand, we're going to try and return the land back to the way it was. We're trying not to, uh, you know, damage the water systems uh, or, or ret you know, retaining the water that's used to, to extract. But uh, what do you what do you say to our you know inherent natural resources that we're very very strong in in Canada versus yeah. 
the, fossil this fuels is, in general. This know. is sort of the, the problem is we all grew up with abundance, and I mean grew up as a country. Hundreds of years, we've never lacked for anything, right? Especially water, uh, natural resources, aggregate wood, that kind of thing. So yeah. um, when we start seeing the problems that other areas of the world are having, you know, they've already reached that point um, that we're not yet at when yeah. it comes to resources. And so yeah. it's definitely a, a mindset shift um, and building habits into people, even little steps, becomes very difficult because they're mm -hmm. used to mm -hmm. a certain level of abundance yeah. and luxury, right? Yeah. I went to a, a conference in Toronto. It was the Electrical Distributors Association conference. And I learned about different provinces and where they got their electricity from. Right. And I, I found that actually Ontario was is pretty strong in renewable energy and, and yep. nuclear power as being a source. So nuclear, hydroelectric, uh, solar, and wind yep. make up, I think, over 90% of our electricity uh, grid, you know, uh, and we are a very, very small portion of fossil fuel. So right. Ontario got, got it. It's, 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 some people are pushing back to say that's why our hydro rates are so high. Uh, you know, I just look at my own experience. My, my, my house, my hydro bill is, is usually not more than $100 in my house. Now, I've converted all my lights to LED, and I, sure. I try and turn things off, and I keep it. Yep. When you think about it, it's $100 to be able to have power on anything at your, at, you know, at, at it your is, whim. Yeah. It, it's really a ridiculously low amount of money. I spend more money on coffee at Tim Hortons every <laughs> month. Right. Honestly, than than my hydro bill is. So yeah, and and you saw that sort of energy mix come to fruition through things like the Green Energy Act, and the feed-in tariff program, and encouraging those renewable energy systems, not just the consumer side but the production side. Yeah. We've seen the solar industry grow. We've seen the wind industry grow. Yeah. Um, nuclear, while it's a low carbon op option, has other environmental impacts like waste. But right. you know, when it comes down to it, uh, we are still feeding the peak condition with fossil fuel burning and that's where you get these spikes in greenhouse gas emissions so it's right. it's a matter of leveling our usage when everyone turns everything on august at 4 p.m um you we end up spiking having to go to that that yeah. natural gas solution which yeah. is where we end up emitting more than than we do on a typical basis yeah. thank you we're going to take a quick break here uh, grant and we'll get back and we'll talk more about sustainability about sustainable orangeville and about uh, what we can do as a council to uh, improve our lives. Great, thank you. Hi, we're back. This is Talk 519 and we're with Councillor Grant Peters, who's Chair of Sustainable Orangeville. Grant, I just uh, wanted to start in, uh, now to talk about Sustainable Orangeville. This is um, a name change for this uh, committee of, of Town Council. Can you just talk briefly about uh, the name change? And, sure. Yeah, yeah it, mm -hmm. I'd love to. So it was the Orangeville Sustainability Action Team, which was quite a mouthful. Mm -hmm. uh, they were in existence for just over 10 years before our council term started. Um, and I, th I think it just didn't have a lot of buzz around it. The people that knew it knew it well, but a lot of people in the community didn't know right. what we were, what we did. Of course, they sat on that committee before becoming a member of council. Uh, and so now as the chair, as part of a, a rebranding, if you will, and an awareness thing, uh, we've moved now more in line with other committees like Heritage Orangeville, Access Orangeville, uh, so Sustainable Orangeville sort of uh, rolls off the tongue a little better and, and gives us a bit of a refresh. We now have a bit of a logo mm -hmm. for some of our materials, and, uh, but we continue to do the same good work. Right. And, you know, I saw somewhere um, definition of sustainability as being the commitment to not leave things in a worse state for the next generation, right? They, you know, and that, that that's kind of what the way I feel about it. And uh, 
if um, you know the actions that, that the municipality takes and, and council can provide some guidance and policies in that uh, regard but you know we, we reach into building and planning and you know we, we've had floods here in Orangeville we need yep. to, to, to try and resolve those things and uh, what are some of the challenges I think the sustainable Orangeville can tackle and help uh, make better for Orangeville residents? Yeah the great part about the committee is that it's got a fairly wide berth it's a it's a very large scope mm -hmm. if you will right there are planning issues there are um, ecological issues there are waste issues um, so we have a number of subcommittees uh, one of them that continued from last time was the active transportation committee it started with the bike routes uh, we now have the cycling and trails master plan so implementing that will be a sort of a, a focus of ours same with the sustainable neighborhood action plan was a bit of a project from the previous term uh, that will now likely come to fruition uh, this term in terms of guiding principles for municipal decisions and, and staff and to, uh, to follow. Um, we continue to do the tree planting days, the, uh, the Earth Week events, uh, and anyone who was paying attention uh, a couple of months ago, we gave out the environmental awards and that was in their 10th year. So uh, that recognizes people in the community that are doing great things. They don't have to be committee members, they you know, don't have to be uh, getting a ton of credit for it. Uh, a lot of people do this for uh, mm -hmm. passion and, and mm -hmm. environmental reasons rather than credit you know yeah. uh, credit and and uh, fame but um, did you want to mention some of those people that, that won yeah no yeah. I think I think we should so yeah. there was four categories uh, in the business category deja vu diner was the winner mm -hmm. uh, Jen Betts over there has been doing a, a number of innovative things when it comes to how restaurants uh, produce uh, waste or reduce their waste creamers Creamers, exactly. Uh, perfect how, example. How many dozens of creamers does, breakfast does a breakfast place? Breakfast place. Hundreds every, every day. Right? Exactly. So, so going to ceramic containers, uh, building in a little more fridge space, uh, it's something you don't see. And, and you know, we think that's among other uh, yeah. initiatives, it needs to be recognized. And I'm sure plastic straws are probably not put in, in drinks when they're, they're served. Exactly. Yeah. And, and they add up when you're in operation seven days a week, right? So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, so that was the business category. In mm -hmm. the group category, we had a uh, a class from Parkinson Elementary. Yes. Um, we've had previous winners from Spencer Ave. Uh, you know, a really strong teacher with environmental principles can really invigorate a class to take on projects and, and build awareness around environmental issues. So right. um, that's great to see in our community. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was a winner in that category. Uh, we had a young woman, Annika Bennett, who uh, attends fundraisers and uh, tree planting events and, and builds awareness and uh, really spreads the word in the community about environmental issues. Uh, right. And so she was a a front runner and, and received the award this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course former councillor Sylvia Bradley who started OSAT uh, back in 2008 and also recently won a Credit Valley Conservation Award, uh, one of the highest awards for watershed excellence. So yeah. obviously her contributions, uh, are, they, they make up a long list and so she was a very deserving recipient. Yeah, Sylvia's been a champion for sure on environmental issues here in, in this town for many, many years. So congratulations to all those people. Um, you touched on, on waste there, and I know uh, as, as, as the Deputy Mayor and myself sit on Dufferin County uh, Council, yep. and that uh, the waste management contract is going to be coming up, uh, I think at the end of this year, beginning of, of 2020. And um, we, we need to look at that and see how we can uh, be, be better. For instance, at this conference I attended uh, in Quebec City, I talked to, to a company, they will build a facility for you to take your waste and they'll recycle 90% of the solid waste and end up with only 10% right. afterwards. And some of the products, they, they take plastic and they grind it, the pla they separate the plastic up, they create some composting material and they're building these facilities for free, which really? is mind boggling. Wow. All they want is the tipping fee which a landfill gets, yep, and um, that's it. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, what's wrong with this story? <laughs> this sounds fantastic. So they built a facility, I think, in Chester, Nova Scotia, and it's going to be opening this summer, right? right. The next two two months. We should we should be sending you down to check it out because yeah. they were excellent. they were reaching out to municipalities, say, hey, we're prepared to build these facilities to take your solid waste. Yep. and recycle 90% of it. Only 10% would go to landfill then. That's yeah, amazing. The amazing. waste discussion has really 
uh, boomed lately. There's a lot of people talking about it. The county came out with their long-term mm -hmm. management strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, they're looking at textile recycling. They're looking at every other week garbage. They're looking at initiatives on both ends, right? Yeah. Not just, you know, can we recycle more, but can we reduce the volume we're creating in the first place? Yeah. Um, even the province, you know, has started mentioning things like take back programs and producer responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, is is it Tim Horton's fault that uh, they have billions of cups produced, uh, you know, in a year, or is it the consumer's fault? It, you know, yeah. really, we have to work together to find solutions to to reduce the amount of waste we're generating because we've got nowhere to put it. <laughs> One of the things that that I, I wonder about Tim Hortons is paper cup, plastic lid. Why can't we have a paper lid? I, now, is it is it the steam will you know, make, make it soggy, I guess. I, I right. don't know. I, but it just seems like a natural thing to try and, and do that. Um, but, yeah. um, you know, big corporations, uh, <laughs> they listen to their, their patrons and, uh, you know, they've probably tested these kind of things and come back to this as being the, uh, the way to go. But I, I think there's a lot of room for innovation yeah. in, in the materials sector for people to figure these things out. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing that concerns me is, is packaging at source. I mean, you know, I know you're very cognizant about this because your family is, you guys are the, um, the, the world champions in, ter in terms of reduction in, in, in waste uh, production in a, in a household. It's fantastic. But so you must be very cognizant when you're out shopping um, we are. about what you, you do. But, you know, this hard plastic stuff, you've got something this big and they, they make, it's for shelf space, right? It is. And yeah. so, presentation, the presentation, and shelf space, and to, in order to do this, I think it's, it's incumbent upon governments to say, "Hey, we're not going to accept this anymore." You, 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 you know, again, <laughs> pushback from big corporations. Certainly, it's 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 a real battlefield out there in terms of. Uh, you know, companies want you know pushing back on government control on marketing and all these things, but right. it's really um, you know more education of of, of the buyer. And, you yes. know, if we if you've can admitted to probably say, well, I'm not buying that good at all, right? right. So if we can educate people more uh, about that, that's probably the only way you're going <laughs> to make it make as, it work. As that momentum grows, the, the companies have to start realizing to keep their market share they need to look at other solutions. Um, so, like I said, it has to happen from both sides because the consumer needs to be able to, to walk away from that product and at the same time, the company needs to be able to invest in a solution that is gonna satisfy not just the consumer but the environment mm -hmm. at, at large. One of the things that, that, that we need to do, I think, and I was talking to manufacturers of recycling bins in, in Quebec City and uh, you've seen the big blue ones that are on wheels. Yep, Peel Region does those. There's the ability to subdivide those, put, and, and I think um, people like to recycle, but they don't know exactly what to recycle. And there's, yes. spo you know, some of, of the recycling is spoiled because, so we need to educate people more, but also give them an easier way to um, separate their different recycled right. products. And maybe subdividing a recycle bin might be the way to. And putting a map saying, you know, on the inside of the lid, hey, sure, dum dum, this is <laughs> this is what you do, and don't yeah. don't throw your dirty, you know, uh, composting material in with the newspaper because you've just you, killed the whole thing. You've got kind of two extreme schools of people. You've, you've got the people that think, no matter what I throw in there, it's going to get sorted for me, so I don't worry about it. Yeah. You've got the people that say, mm. I don't need to use that program because nothing gets recycled. It's all just a hoax anyway. Yeah. Um, they, the truth is in the middle, right? Yeah. If we can sort properly, if we can avoid the contamination yeah. and cross mingling of these goods, yeah. then the recycling programs can flourish. Yeah. And the waste management companies, if we can give them a pre-sorted product, it's, yep. it's likely that the cost is going to be less because they're going to be able to actually generate income off of Yep. These these abilities to recycle newspaper, their cardboard, operations whether become plastic, more efficient, and their become market becomes. Uh, so we're we're kind of pushing the sorting operation back to the resident of the right. town by doing this instead of having you know a plant full of people yep. doing this, right? And, and so that's the easiest place to sort it is in the home. And and when recycling programs first started, 
people got into the habit of washing out their cans and you know sorting metals for plastics and that kind of thing and yeah. I think somewhere along the line the one box system just sort of yeah. fell apart and people uh, yeah. started throwing just about anything in there well you know I, I understand a, a pizza box that's got grease on the bottom of it the top is good but the bottom isn't right I, I mean I know that now but most people don't but it can you rip that off and, and yep. do a little pre-sort. Uh, so this will be part of the county's uh, outreach program. The education for them is going to yeah. be a focus. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things that I've been pushing is, is communication, right, uh, yeah. to our residents. And things like mobile apps and, 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 a, and a, an improved website where we can educate people and push information out to people. Agreed. We've only got about a minute left here, Grant. So sure. Sustainable Orangeville, what, what do you think are one or two um, you know, quickly now, one or two items that, that you would like to see happen in the next three years, you know, in, in Orangeville to, to, yeah, I to think help with environmental issues. I think a lot of it is going to come down to the Sustainable Neighborhood Action Plan. Um, there's a lot of metrics and goals that are going to come out of that document. There's sort of seven broad categories that cover um, anything from water to ecology to energy. Um, Really, that's going to be the guiding document for staff, but I think Sustainable Orangeville needs to take a look at that and say, you know, what expertise do we have around the table? Which initiatives can we have more of a grassroots uh, involvement on uh, and really accelerate those things? Because when the staff and the community can work together, um, we're going to accelerate the progress of, of those types of things. Grant, thank you very much. I think we need to uh, talk more about sustainability. I really want to thank you for uh, joining me today and we're looking for a healthy future for our residents. And Thanks for having me. All the best. Thank you.